Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at an alternate concept of morality, uh, one that's been on uh, around for a while, originally as a theory of justice, but has been adapted uh, to moral theory uh, more or less recently. Uh, it's called a social contract theory. Uh, and it's basically a theory that relies on a kind of agreement, or at least ideal agreement between persons to establish or set up a moral code. First off, uh, let's define uh, what a social contract theory is and take a look at some of the some of its origins. Uh, it was originally, of course, as I mentioned before, a theory of justice, uh, and this comes about in the Enlightenment period, uh, but it's more lately been applied to morality in some of the years uh, post-World War II. A, a good definition actually comes from uh, James Re Rachels, the uh, definition that uh, Schaefer Landau gives is very similar to this one. It says this, it says, morality consists in the set of rules governing behavior that rational people would accept on the condition that others accept them as well. So you get this notion of a contract, a kind of agreement between people, a, a mutual agreement. The idea is that everybody agrees to follow all of the same rules as each other, as long as everybody else agrees to follow just those same rules. Uh, that's the uh, essential point behind a social contract theory is that it makes uh, something out of that kind of agreement, uh, right? You know, assuming that uh, you can uh, get people to say, uh, you know, that, that, that keeping one's promises or keeping one agreements is a kind of right thing to do. All social contract theories uh, have, uh, they, they share a method in common, and the method works something like this. You're supposed to imagine life without some kind of government or without a moral code. And then you, by imagining this, uh, I mean, you don't have to actually uh, say that this ever happened, that anyone ever actually lived this way or anything like that. Sometimes uh, these theories are misunderstood as saying, oh, once upon a time there was no rules at all and then people had to make them. Uh, that's probably not exactly true. Uh, instead, there's a, a method in common. What you do is you imagine life without some sort of government or moral rules. You just imagine, uh, again, using everything you know about the way that people are, about life in general, and then you can discover some of the problems, right? Uh, sometimes I refer to this as the it's a wonderful life method of moral reasoning, uh, because essentially uh, this is a reference to the, the really great film, It's a Wonderful Life, which if you haven't seen it, um, you, you know, get under out from under the rock you've been under and go see it. Uh, in, in a sense, in this film, uh, the main character, uh, George Bailey, is, you know, has uh, experiences some misfortune and goes out with the intent to uh, kill himself and because uh, he you know, thinks things have just gone too far off the rails to be saved. And his guardian angel uh, saves his life and, and shows him what life would really have been like if he hadn't ever existed. Uh, and so he realizes how much good he's really done, how valuable, uh, in, in a sense, how wonderful his life has really been. And that's, that's what we're doing here. We're trying to see how wonderful a moral code is or how wonderful a government is uh, by just imagining uh, what life is like without it, right? So uh, imagining what life is like without a particular thing sometimes really does help you to identify what's really important about that thing. And that's the point here. And then the idea is uh, for step three, you propose a solution to the problems that, that you have without some sort of government or moral code that any reasonable person then would agree to. And that solution is, is in effect, the social contract. It's the thing that everybody uh, would, would mutually agree upon if they were being at all reasonable. The very first form of social contract is owed to uh, this man here, who's uh, this is a, a painting of him, which is uh, why it's, it's, it's in color. Uh, this is Thomas Hobbes. Uh, he lived from 1588 to 1679, and he's very famous uh, for publication of this really, really big book called The Leviathan. A lot of times people think that the word Leviathan refers to the size of the book. It does not. Uh, it, it refers to one of the central concepts of the book. Um, Hobbes himself lived through a very, you know, sort of destructive period in, in European history. He, uh, you know, uh, had all kinds of trouble with uh, the English Civil War, uh, and, and so he was very much concerned about orderliness um, and, uh, and, and peace and uh, uh, the, the foundations of a stable government. Uh, and so, so those are some of the issues that he wrote about, and his writings really kind of didn't make him popular with, with really much of anybody at the time. Um, but we owe a, a, an enormous amount to his political thought, which is, uh, was very far-seeing um, and, uh, and very, very important. 
Uh, just a, a brief note, uh, Hobbes has something of a reputation for having a very pessimistic view of human nature. That's just one of the things that uh, people will often say about Hobbes. And I, I myself don't think that this is entirely fair, uh, but I'll let you make up your own mind after having, after just looking at his reasoning, uh, uh, looking what, at what he does actually say. Uh, and I think that uh, you could uh, judge uh, the, the case for yourself. So remember, step one is to remember, uh, or to imagine, sorry, uh, life without any sort of government or, or, or moral rules or something like that. Uh, and this is what we call uh, the state of nature, or what, what Hobbes referred to as the state of nature, or uh, people in their natural state. So without government, people are in their natural state. Right? This is what philosophers call uh, this state of nature. Now Hobbes points out that the state of nature is a state of equality. And what he means by that is this, that people are more or less evenly matched. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody's exactly the same. But if you really think about it, people are reasonably evenly matched. Uh, yeah, some people are stronger than others, but nobody is so much stronger than anybody else that they can just get whatever they want without any fear of anything. If you did, and some group of people have some brute who, you know, sort of just uh, uh, beat anything they wanted out of anybody, you'd imagine everybody else would simply gang up on them. And uh, even the weakest person is strong enough to be dangerous to the strongest person. Uh, so again, people are more or less evenly matched. And the same thing goes for wits. Uh, while some people are somewhat more clever than another, nobody is so clever that they can just get everything they want and, 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 and exclude all others. Uh, you know, So even, even the least clever is clever enough that they can't be entirely underestimated or, or discounted even by the very clever. Uh, and so neither our, our brains nor our uh, brawn uh, is, is so far in advance of everybody else's uh, that we just get whatever we want. Right? And that's what Hobbes means by the state of nature being a state of equality. In addition to that, people are, uh, nobody has any authority over anybody else, right? There's certainly, there's no government, there's no moral code. Uh, nobody really has the right to tell anyone else what to do, and everybody knows it. Right? That's, the, that's the state of nature that we're imagining. So you know what? Let's imagine this right along with Hobbes. So here you are in the state of nature. There are no rules. You get to do whatever you want, whenever you want. You can wander around the world, pick a little bit of fruit, gather together. You're going to need that later. You know, you kick back, you, you relax, you enjoy the pretty trees and whatever else it is you do during in the state of nature. The world, as they say, is your burrito. In fact, the only thing that could really get in the way of all of the great fun you'll have in the state of nature is, well, somebody else. Now you account, encounter this other person and think, what are they like? What sorts of things do they enjoy? What sorts of things do they need? Right? What are their wants? What are their desires? And in fact, the best answer to that question, given that you don't really know this person, is pretty much always, well, probably pretty much what I like and what I need and what my desires are. And so you notice that, oh, well, they have gather a little bit of fruit themselves. They do kind of like the same things you like, and they need the same things that you need. And they, not knowing you, are making the same assumptions about you, that you're pretty much like them. You know what? You're both right. You're very much like one another, being both human beings. Well, this is a, a sketchy situation here. Uh, how do you know whether you trust this person? In fact, uh, uh, this person might just be after your fruit. And of course, you see their fruits, a nice little pile of fruit there. You think maybe, maybe you ought to even be after their fruit. And of course, what are they thinking? Well, they're thinking exactly the same thing. That maybe you're after their fruit. And maybe they even ought to be after yours. And so, you grab your nice shillelagh stick, right? Because who would go into the state of nature without a good shillelagh, right? Uh, no rational person would do something like that. Uh, which, of course, means that your opponent also has a shillelagh. Of course they would. It's the state of nature. You don't go around without a shillelagh. Are you crazy? Um, 
And so, so now it's, a, it's another standoff, right? If neither of you were armed, it would be just the same sort of standoff. But of course, both of you are, because both of you know that you're prepared to escalate the violence in order to protect your fruit and uh, maybe gain a little more fruit in the balance. So it seems like each of you have two choices, right? You've got the choice of either war or peace, right? That is, you can be prepared for attack or prepared to defend yourself, or you can decide, you know what, this person's okay. I don't need to expend all of my energy being watchful uh, or even con contemplating a first strike or anything like that. I choose peace, right? Now, you might ask yourself, what choices do they have? Well, same ones as you do. They can choose war or they can choose peace. And so now we have a situation where what each player gets here in this little game uh, depends on the move of the other. And this is a kind of situation that's dealt with by a branch of, of, of philosophy called game theory. And so we can break this down into a little bit of a matrix. If, of course, you both choose peace, well, great. You go about your business, they go about their business, no problem. It's live and let live. If you choose peace and your opponent chooses war, well, they get an easy win. They kill you, they get your fruit. But if the opposite happens, and you choose war and they choose peace, you get the easy win. You kill them, you take their fruit. And so if you both choose war then, notice you're both prepared for it, and so it's going to be a, probably a fight to the death. And in such a fight, it's possible you'll both be grievously injured or even fatally injured. So let's call this one a 50-50 at best, right? Uh, you've got a you've got a fighting chance, but uh, it's likely enough you may suffer a life changing injury, even if you technically win. Well, now let's think about this from uh, from a third person perspective. If you are somebody else who is not really involved in this situation at all, you're not one of these two people. It seems obvious what the best choice for the both of them is. It's to live and let live, right? They both go on and, and you know have their own fruit, and they get to you know possibly even cooperate with one another. That's that's what what uh, game theorists call the optimal solution. Optimal is just a fancy word that means best. And so that's the best overall outcome. It's the live and let live outcome. But in order to get that outcome, it would require both players to choose peace. Now think about it this way: if you are one of these players. What are you going to pick? If you choose peace, then at best, it's a tie, right? You just get the live and let live option. But at worst, there's this possibility of complete disaster. Your own death and, uh, you know, of course, even worse, your fruit gets taken by your enemy. Uh, but if you choose war, at best, the best case scenario is an easy win and the elimination of a rival. Whereas the worst case scenario is the tie, where at least you have a fighting chance. And so, since you recognize that war is the most rational option, why would you expect your opponent not to choose war as well? And if you suspect that your opponent's going to choose war, that makes it even less likely that you're going to choose peace, because again, that would lead to disaster for you. Even if you said, uh, even if you said to your opponent, you say, you know what? Look, buddy, if we both choose peace, we both end up better off. Uh, I, I promise uh, eternal friendship to you. I, you know, let us become blood brothers this day and let us never harm each other. Right. Well, what's that going to sound like from the other side? Even if you really mean it, do you actually expect them to believe you? Likewise, if they say to you, you know, let us... Let us make promises here to, you know, uh, you know, cross our heart and hope to die and, and never kill each other ever, ever, because I'm a nice guy. You're a nice guy. We can we can just live together. Uh, we'll we'll be fine. It'll be it'll be better for us. Even if they mean it, can you afford to believe them? This basic interaction between these two folks, right between you and and, and this rival of yours. Uh, Will, will, will sort of determine uh, the outcome. The rational choice for each individual is simply to choose war. Right? You have no, you know, there's too much risk 
in believing if they say that they're you know going to choose peace, right? You know, in fact, uh, saying they were going to choose peace might in fact be the very best move to get you to try and choose peace, so they can get an easy win. Uh, and likewise with you to them, right? If if you can think of the strategy, they can think of the strategy. And so uh, again, the rational decision from the, the from the point of view of each of the parties is to choose war. And so what ends up happening they, is, is each of these players get this 50-50 at best outcome, which is actually the worst available outcome. And that's the state of nature. In fact, this particular kind of uh, setup is called a prisoner's dilemma. Prisoner's dilemma is any situation in which the individually rational decision leads people into the overall worst outcome. And there are many of these in, uh, in, in life in general. The reason it's called a prisoner's dilemma is because of the example that's usually used to explain it. If you've ever turned on a television, you've probably seen some sort of a cop show or a crime drama or something like that. And it happens frequently enough on these shows that they ex the, 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 the police suspect a couple of individuals of uh, committing a crime uh, you know, in, in cooperation with each other. Uh, or of a couple of different people both knowing something about the other, you know, in terms of a, a crime committed. Uh, and uh, the, the idea is that uh, uh, the, the police can't really prove anything without a confession, and so they're going to try and get uh, each of these people to crack. And so what do they do? They always put them in two separate rooms, and they both tell them the same thing. They both say, look, you know, uh, if, if this other guy rats you out and, you know, uh, he's in the other room, you know, maybe he's singing like a canary. But if he rats you out and you stay quiet, well, you're going to go away for a long time and he's going to get away scot-free. He's going to get a real good deal for, for the cooperation. But if you rat him out, you're going to get the good deal for cooperation. And then if he stays silent, he goes away for a long time. Well, of course, what happens is that each of these people in isolation of each other uh, will will mistrust each other enough to say that they'll, they'll see the obvious advantages in uh, sort of betraying the other one, uh, even if they expect the other one uh, will, especially if they expect the other one will stay quiet. Um, but even if they expect that the other one will betray them, uh, there's a, a certain pressure to try and be the one that betrays the other one first or something like that, or uh, to at least make sure that they guarantee themselves uh, that there's the sort of worst case tie instead of, you know, the, the sort of exposing themselves to the disaster of going away for a long time while the other one gets away scot-free. And so what ends up happening is they end up generally turning on each other, uh, defecting from the, the partnership or cooperation, and both ratting each other out, and then they both go away, which is, of course, the, the collective, at least for the two of them, the worst outcome. This idea of a prisoner's dilemma, uh, like I said, has a lot of different applications to social and political life. I'll just give you a couple. Uh, one of these is is this. Imagine you're a shepherd. Uh, if you have a bunch of sheep, and of course you have your own land with your own grass on it, and you know if the if you let the sheep graze on it too often, it'll it'll you know put that in danger. So you got to make sure you save your own land and, and make sure the grass recovers enough between grazings to 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 maintain your flock of sheep. But now imagine there's also this parcel of common land. There's nobody really owns it. You know, it's a sort of public land, as it were. There's grass on it. And so where are you going to take your, ship, your sheep to graze? Well, pretty obviously, you're going to take them to the common land to save your own, right? Uh, because, you know, nobody owns it, so you'll need it. Now, imagine there are a bunch of other shepherds in your community. What are they going to pick? Well, they're going to pick the same thing as you picked and for the same reason. And so everyone's going to graze their sheep on the common land. And it's going to get trashed. It's going to get overused. And then it gets lost as a resource for everybody. And so by doing the individually rational thing, uh, you ended up with a sort of public disaster, the worst overall outcome. And so uh, that's where uh, prisoners' dilemmas uh, really contribute a lot to uh, a lot of environmental damages, because everybody kind of has, uh, you know, an incentive to take advantage of the environment, uh, but nobody has uh, an uh, and everyone has a disincentive to be the one to sort of bear the cost of preserving an environment or sort of, you know, conserving various uh, things and resources like using your own grass instead of using the common land, stuff like that. 
uh, if you look at, say, you know, uh, the, the, the federal budget, right, uh, every person in Congress has an incentive, right, an electoral incentive to get money out of the budget and into their districts. Uh, but everybody has a disincentive to put money from their districts into the budget. That's taxation. Um, and so what happens is you typically get a whole lot more spending from the budget than you get uh, uh, revenue into the budget, right? And then that's uh, that's kind of how that happens. It's, a, it's a, again, another large-scale multiplayer uh, prisoner's dilemma where the individually rational call ends up uh, leading to the collective worst outcome. Now, of course, all of these uh, prisoners' dilemmas have something in common. They all can be gotten out of in more or less the same way. Uh, and if a prisoner's dilemma continues to lead us into sort of bad outcomes, well, let's uh, see what it would take to get us out of these bad outcomes to save us from them to begin with. And so speaking of bad outcomes, this is how Hobbes ultimately describes what the state of nature is like. It's a very famous paragraph, so I've gone ahead and quoted it in its entirety. Uh, he says, therefore, whatever results from a time of war, when every man is enemy to every man, also results from a time when men live with no other security, but what their own strength and ingenuity provides them with. In such conditions, there is no place for hard work, because there is no assurance that it will yield results. And consequently, no cultivation of the earth, no navigation or use of materials that can be imported by sea, no construction of large buildings, no machines for moving things that require much force, no knowledge of the face of the earth, no account of time, no practical skills, no literature or scholarship, no society, and worst of all, continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man is solitary poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Very famous uh, quote from Hobbes. So whenever you hear people talk about life being uh, solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short, uh, this is a, a direct reference to this particular idea of Hobbes that uh, without a government, you know, in, in a state of nature, uh, that, that life would be a sort of a war of everyone against everyone. Uh, there would be no room for anything else, uh, and, and uh, it, would be, it would be pretty horrible. So here's the thing. Uh, nobody will, will believe you that you've read Hobbes unless you have that whole solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short business, right? Uh, and so, in addition to uh, to this this particular you know picture of uh, of the state of nature, uh, I, I mean let's let's exhibit examine this uh, this assumption that he makes. Imagine you're in the state of nature and you decide you know I'd love nothing else than just to be a painter and paint my paintings and, and live my life happily. Well, if if you decide to act that way in the state of nature, someone's going to kill you and take your painting. And if you decide, you know what, I'd really like to do, I'd really like to study ancient languages. And so while you're bent over a scroll somewhere, somebody will kill you and take your, you know, whatever you have, maybe your scroll or your fruit or uh, you know, whatever, or just kill you just so that you don't uh, ever get any ideas in your head about killing them. So uh, again, there's, there's all of this stuff that all of the benefits of society, like trade, and cooperation, uh, you know, just not having to uh, defend your own life against everybody else all the time because of all the fearful suspicion, uh, all of these things are, 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 are just absent in the, the, the state of nature, all of the, the, the good things that a civilization or a society brings with it. And so here's how Hobbes proposes to get out of the state of nature. And he, he proposes a kind of agreement. That's what the term covenant means here. He says, what if a covenant is made in which the parties do not perform now, but trust one another to perform at an appropriate time in the future? So what he's talking about here is a kind of long-standing agreement, and that's the kind of agreement that a social contract is. It's a long-term agreement between, uh, between all people who are, are party to the agreement, all parties of the society. He says, if this happens in the condition of mere nature, that is, in the state of nature, which is war of every man against every man, then the contract is void if one of the parties has a reasonable suspicion that the other is not going to perform. For the one who performs first has no assurance that the other will perform later, because the bonds of words are too weak to rein in men's ambition, greed, anger, and other passions, unless there is something to be feared from some coercive power. And in the condition of mere nature, 
where all men are equal and are judges of the reasonableness of their own fears, there can't possibly be such a power. So he who performs first merely betrays himself to his enemy, which is contrary to his right to defend his life and his means of living. On the other hand, if there is a common power set over both parties to the contract, with right and force sufficient to compel performance, the contract is not made void by the suspicions of either party to it. When there is a power set up to constrain those who would otherwise violate their faith, that fear, namely the suspicion that the other party will not perform, is no longer reasonable. So he who is covenanted to perform first is obligated to do so. Now this is Hobbes's proposed way out. And he talks a lot about the, just the natural psychology of the state of nature. This idea that you don't perform peace because if you do, you know, you, you feel like you're, you, you, you've made yourself out to be possibly the chump in this situation where the other person will simply take advantage of your uh, peacefulness and, uh, you know, get an easy win over you. And so it seems like the only way that you could ever do this is if you both a, make a promise that, that you know, you're sort of mutually saying, yeah, I'm not going to attack you if you don't attack me. Great, we're all good. And set up some kind of a common power that you both agree has the right, right, to prevent you from taking out any uh, sort of revenge or preemptive action against anybody else. So this common power Hobbes calls the Leviathan. This is a quote from uh, uh, the, the Bible, Job chapter 41. The Leviathan's main purpose is to enforce a monopoly on violence. Because, of course, the biggest problem in the state of nature is a security problem. People aren't safe. He says what is worst is this continual fear and danger of violent death. And the life of man is solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short. Right, so the idea is for the Leviathan uh, uh, and some entity. So it could be an organization, it could be you know a, a committee, it could be a nice, good, strong king, the way that the Hobbes preferred it. Uh, but its main purpose is to enforce a monopoly on violence. Right, to say, okay, everybody, you you all, right, who are party to this agreement, have put me in charge. None of you get to use violence anymore. That way, you don't have to be afraid of anybody else using it. And if anybody breaks their promise not to use violence, uh, I'm going to come and, and punish them, right? So that's essentially the role that the Leviathan plays. So the idea is then that any reasonable person to avoid the obvious trouble with the state of nature, this obvious security problem, would agree then to give up their right to use violence over to the Leviathan. They would turn over uh, the, the, their natural rights uh, to uh, to the Leviathan and say, okay, the Leviathan has, has what used to be my right to use violence. Now I don't have it anymore. I've renounced it, again, as long as everybody else renounces it as well. Uh, you know, puts the Leviathan in charge of, of all of us. And so let's take a look at how uh, the presence of the Leviathan changes the rationality of the state of nature. So again, here is the, uh, uh, the the Hobbesian trap or the security dilemma or the prisoner's dilemma that we face in the state of nature, uh, where both parties uh, are, are, you know, uh, out, of, out of just prudence and carefulness, tempted to uh, select war and get the worst outcome. Uh, now, under Le the Leviathan, uh, we have a, a, a sort of a different story. The idea is that uh, the Leviathan reserves the right now to enforce this monopoly on violence. And so if you end up choosing peace and your opponent violates that peace, kills you and takes your fruit, um, or, or if you do that, rather, uh, then, well, of course, the Leviathan will simply kill you. And so you say, well, okay, maybe I don't want to do that. Then maybe I'll, I'll, I'll choose peace. Be like, well, what if, what if the other guy chooses war? Well, uh, if the other guy chooses war, well, then, you know, the Leviathan will kill them uh, right after they kill you and take your fruit. And so the idea is that you know that each of you has a kind of disincentive to do that. Uh, but the idea is if you both chose war anyway, despite your incentives to choose peace, uh, well, I might then kill both of you. So now, uh, now take a look at this situation. What's the rational choice? If you choose war, you're going to die, right? That's, you know, again, the, assuming the very simplest of possible punishments uh, for the, that the Leviathan could use to enforce its monopoly on violence. Uh, but the idea is that now all of a sudden, uh, since the, the rules of the game are changed, the way that people play the game entirely changes as well. Obviously, the rational choice is to choose peace. And that makes a really, really big difference. 
And so I want to say a couple of things at this point. The first of which is to revisit this question of Hobbes' uh, uh, so-called pessimistic view of human nature. Now, of course, he has a pessimistic view of what the state of nature would be like uh, uh, w with humans in it. But notice he, he's not saying anything about either of these people as being inherently bloodthirsty uh, or inherently savage uh, or inherently violent or, or anything like that. There's no bloodlust going on here. There's no uh, you know sort of sense of being red in tooth and claw or the sense of this violent pressure that just builds up and has to bust out. It's entirely a rational calculation. Each person is simply trying to survive, trying to keep themselves safe, and trying to prosper and realizing that the other person wants the same things and they can't necessarily both have them, uh, or at least you know at least not comfortably. And so the only thing that makes this whole thing go, uh, you know, what the state of nature is like without the Leviathan and what uh, the human relations are under Le the Leviathan is entirely due to simply the exercise of human reason. Reason and reason alone is responsible for every step of this. That does not sound particularly pessimistic to me. In fact, it's kind of optimistic. If uh, a violence were simply a part of human nature, there really would be nothing we could do about it. But if violence is the result of a particular situation that people find themselves in that might reward violence, then you should expect people to use violence. And so if you want to do something about it, you change the conditions under which people exist. The other thing I really wanted to mention here is uh, that, that Hobbes here makes a kind of testable prediction. Right? The prediction is this, that if the Leviathan, that is a, a, a power that can hold people in common, a, a government in other words, if a government really would make relations among people more peaceful by pacifying them, by sort of giving them incentives to choose peace, by you know punishing any who choose violence, who transgress this promise that they've implicitly made to let the Leviathan uh, uh, enforce a monopoly on violence, then generally speaking, as governments have gotten much larger, much more powerful, and much more well-organized over time, over the last several hundred years, that we should expect to see the rates of violence among people in societies decrease, and really decrease a lot, because governments really have gotten lots more powerful and lots more well-organized over the long, uh, uh, the long view. Well, actually, they do. Right? We see, uh, it, no matter how you look at it, uh, you know, whatever stats you take a look at, you'll notice that the world is, is way, way, way less violent now than it was, uh, you know, uh, 50 years ago. Uh, it's, 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 it's far less violent than it was 100 years ago and, uh, you know, extremely less violent than it was 500 years ago and uh, unbelievably less violent than it was uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, and a lot of that has to do with the rise of something like leviathans. Leviathans really are uh, sort of proven to be a really excellent uh, uh, engine for peace. If you want a lot, uh, a, a much larger and, and more lengthy description of, of some of these processes and others that have resulted in us living in the most peaceable time in human history, uh, you should look up the book, uh, a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature. Uh, the title is derived from a quote by Abraham Lincoln. The book itself is by a Harvard scientist by the name of Stephen Pinker. That's P-I-N-K-E-R. Hobbes, of course, is the first to print a, a social contract, but there are other famous social contract theorists out there. Uh, one of those uh, is one written by a, a Frenchman named Jean-Jacques Rousseau, uh, he proposed a much more optimistic, if much less realistic, version of the social contract in 1762. Uh, his notion was that in the state of nature, everybody's actually peaceful, harmonious, and, and does fine, uh, and that the only reason they sort of come together is because they, you know, they, they need to reproduce somehow, uh, or, or they can't really get everything that they want without some sort of cooperation. Uh, there's, there's some amount of this that makes sense. Uh, certainly the, the cooperation angle uh, is important, right, to, 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 you know, humanity as a species, and cooperation is a rational reason, uh, a rational basis for, for choosing to, to come together, but uh, there's, a, it, it's a, it's a very much a, a sort of a romanticism of a sort of life without a government uh, that I think uh, actual history uh, has, has really, uh, you know, cast a lot of doubt upon, but it is a very famous version of the social contract. 
an even more famous version of the social contract theory, especially if you're an American, uh, comes from a philosopher by the name of John Locke, who, um, you know, like Hobbes, was an Englishman. Uh, he wrote a very important book called The Second Treatise on Government. It was published in 1690. And he proposed in this book that people have, in the state of nature, natural rights. Right? So he imagines groups of people in the state of nature rather than individuals. And so he imagines, look, if you're, if you're living with this group, here's what will happen. Any group recognizes that there are some things you just don't do. One of the things you just don't do is kill anybody. If you kill somebody, everyone else in that group realizes they can't live with you, and they'll either kick you out or probably just kill you to save themselves the trouble of looking over their shoulders all the time. And so any reasonable person who lives with a bunch of other people, even without a government, even without any rules, even without any sort of, you know, statements of morality, realizes if they kill other people, it's going to be really bad for them. They just don't do it. They recognize that that can't be done. Uh, and you, you can't live among uh, people. You can't live in a community if you kill people. That's just, you know, can't happen. The other thing is that people would say that you also should, you know, uh, not mess with anybody's, you know, stuff, right? You're, you know, if somebody's using something, if somebody has, you know, some reason of, uh, to claim something, some, you know, the idea is even without laws or even without some written moral code or anything like that, the idea is, with you know, you don't mess with people's stuff because they'll, you know, they'll, they'll take it the wrong way. They'll get really mad about it. You can't live together while everybody's messing with each other's stuff. So you have to sort of respect each other's boundaries in that sense. And also, you pretty much let people do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting anybody else, right? You don't interfere with them because, again, that's not uh, the kind of thing that you can live in a community with, with, you know, everybody sort of, you know, being in everybody's business all the time. And so this is where Locke gets his idea of these natural rights. The natural rights come out of what he says, the natural law. Natural law is you don't kill anybody, right? Uh, you let people do whatever they want as long as they're not hurting anybody else, and you don't mess with their stuff. And so that gives everybody the natural rights of life, liberty, and property. This uh, uh, part of this list may look very familiar to you. Uh, Thomas Jefferson pretty much, you know, uh, plagiarized uh, plagiarized a lot of the Second Treatise on Government, frankly. Um, in, uh, you know, not in, in a lot of writings, you know, there's a bunch of stuff in the Constitution that, that looks real familiar. Uh, and uh, the Declaration of Independence has some, some amazing parallels uh, to the Declaration of Independence, which Jefferson wrote, which contains the phrase that, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, uh, and that they're given, you know, by their creator certain uh, inalienable rights. And among these are life, liberty, and he says the pursuit of happiness. Why the pursuit of happiness in there? Well, so here's the deal. Uh, uh, any anybody, any educated English person who had read their lock uh, would have known that list, that life, liberty, and p yeah, something that starts with P, O, oh, pursuit of happiness. They would have they would have thought property when they read that phrase. But why didn't why did Jefferson simply say property? Why didn't he simply quote lock? Uh, well, it wasn't to avoid any accusation of plagiarism. He was doing this on purpose. He was quoting a famous formula. Uh, you know, to get, you know, to get across the sort of thing he had in mind. Uh, and of course, the Revolutionary War was very much uh, about property, uh, about taxation and about, you know, people's resources and, and about, you know, the mercantilist system uh, that had made a lot of the gentry in, the, in their minds dependent on England and, and things like that. Uh, so, so, again, why not just simply write the word property instead of this would happen? Well, it, it was not really the non thing that low class for a gentleman like like Jefferson uh, to talk openly about his property or about money, right? It's considered not the done thing. And so uh, he used this very flowery phrase, pursuit of happiness, to stand in for property so that he didn't have to sort of create a kind of social faux pas. Uh, and so uh, the, the irony is that that sort of flowery, meaningless stand in for property has really uh, sort of inspired a lot of people. And it's, it's considered very lofty rhetoric. It does sound very nice, um, even though having a right to pursue happiness doesn't actually make all that much sense to pursue happiness, whether anybody gives you a right to do that or not, and it certainly doesn't guarantee you'll get it. Um, but, uh, but that's the idea. So uh, uh, Locke, in any it it says that the problem in the state of nature, even though people realize or recognize that everybody has uh, these these natural rights, that you know the, the state of nature is governed by this natural law, he says the big problem is that everybody's pretty selfish, right? Everyone has these self-serving biases, uh, and you want to, uh, it, it, you don't really get your rights adequately protected because everybody gets to be a judge in their own case. And so when you're a judge in your own case, you go way too far in condemning other people, 
and you don't go nearly far enough in condemning yourself or the people you like or are related to or something like that. And so even though people recognize that everybody has these natural rights, you really don't actually get the benefit of them without having a government in there that's largely impartial, right? That's not part of, you know, it's not involved in any of the disputes between people. So the judges are impartial. The people who enforce the rules don't really care who you are. They just enforce the rules. And the people who make the rules don't make the rules to try and benefit any particular people or, or other, right? They, they make rules. They're just for everybody, period. And so any government would have to have a nice impartial legislature, an impartial executive, and an impartial judicial function, right? So if that doesn't sound familiar to you, uh, you know, well, uh, it, it should. Uh, but that's uh, that's all, all from Locke. Locke, in a lot of ways, is sort of the official philosopher of the American Revolution and the early American uh, way of thinking about government. So we're going to move on from some of these Enlightenment era uh, concepts. Uh, this, uh, this, uh, this idea of of uh, the social contract as a great uh, way of justifying a government, right? And it's, and, and we're going to start looking at uh, some some more modern versions of the social contract, specifically uh, the kind of contract theory given by uh, this fellow here, a fellow by the name of John Rawls. He was born in 1921 and died in 2002. He worked at Harvard for most of his career, and he's famous for this uh, uh, book uh, about well, the book describes a theory of justice and is called a theory of justice. Uh, philosophers are, are really excellent at naming things. So the first thing that Rawls wants us to do is wants us to imagine, uh, this, is, this is parallel to uh, Hobbes or Locke imagining a state of nature. What he wants to imagine is that people uh, are, are approaching the question of what kind of moral code there should be or what kind of society we should have uh, uh, from what he calls the original position, uh, also known as uh, from behind the veil of ignorance. The idea is he talks about people choosing something or agreeing to something, and this is what makes this view a social contract view. So uh, the, the idea is that we're supposed to all choose something from behind the veil of ignorance. Now, of course, what does that mean? So uh, the veil of ignorance is a kind of nickname he gives to the original position. Those are They, they both mean the same thing in his writing. And so behind the veil of ignorance, people are rational, okay? They are self-interested, they care what happens to themselves, and they are ignorant of their particular endowments and their place in society. And this is why he calls it the veil of ignorance, because it's a thing that, that prevents you from knowing something about yourself. So what we're supposed to do is imagine a bunch of people choosing a society, choosing a moral code, without knowing anything about themselves, right? So when we talk about their particular endowments, we say that we don't know whether they're fast or slow, tall or short, uh, you know, you know, uh, uh, male, male or female. They don't know what race they are. They don't know what their particular interests are. Uh, they don't know uh, really anything uh, in particular about themselves. They don't know whether they have a great sense of humor or not. Um, and, and they also don't know their place in society, whether they're going to be rich, whether they're going to be poor, sort of who in society they're going to be. And so then Rawls proposes that from this uh, very interesting sort of place, that the ideal society, the best one, the most just one, uh, the, the best society, the best moral code, is the one that everyone would agree to from behind the veil of ignorance. So if you get a bunch of rational and self-interested people who don't know where they're going to be in any particular society, they don't know anything about themselves, everything that they would all agree to anyway is going to be the ideal society. And that's that's a, going to be a clue of how it would look. And the purpose of the veil here now is, is essentially to remove self-serving bias. Uh, in fact, very much the thing that motivated John Locke to argue for the necessity of having a good government is because it, it uh, takes out of uh, all sorts of different people's hands the kinds of self-serving biases that they uh, would naturally have otherwise. And so the, the purpose of not knowing anything about your particular you know, endowments or, or place in society is so that you wouldn't then agree to something that would might, you know, might benefit you, but you know, sort of wouldn't benefit somebody else. So if you don't know, for example, whether you were tall or short, you wouldn't support a society that really punished short people or really punished tall people because you're like, well, gosh, I wouldn't know if I was one of them. 
And so for this reason, Rawls's theory is often called the sort of the blind taste test theory of justice, uh, because a blind taste test itself is regarded as the most fair way of evaluating things against each other, of sort of comparing and contrasting things. And so if you're having, you know, tasting beverages or something like that, the reason you do a blind taste test is so that the packaging uh, doesn't start to, you know, uh, mess with people's expectations, all right, because they can fool themselves into thinking that one thing is a little better than the other. And, And in a sense, once you remove all this bias, you remove a particular kind of error, um, then you can you can end up with a much fairer result. And that's pretty much the intuition that Rawls taps into here with his original position. And so now let's take a look at some criticisms of social contract theory. Now, of course, again, like most of the criticisms of reasonably good theories, uh, there are some responses that, that uh, contract theorists may have to some of these kinds of claims. Uh, some of which are better than others. The first criticism uh, I'd like to take a look at uh, is this uh, notion of of, of moral motivation, right? Of, you know, why should somebody follow uh, this kind of moral code to begin with? And so uh, we're going to go all the way back to Hobbes. Hobbes and other social contract theorists think uh, that you have no essential reason to be moral uh, if it's not in your self-interest to do so. And so uh, one of the things that they all point out, uh, and and of course this was the case with Hobbes and the case with Rawls, uh, they point out that it is in your self-interest to uh, adopt one of these uh, kinds of of contract theories. uh, theories. Uh, For Hobbes, he sort of demonstrates how bad the state of nature is, uh, how bad life is without this. And so says any rational person ought to agree to end the state of nature as quickly as possible, to enter into some kind of agreement, to put uh, an enforcer in place to make sure everybody holds up their end of the bargain, because life with those agreements is so much better for everybody than life without them. In fact, this is a one of the things that uh, is, is really important about social contract theories uh, is that they, they present this kind of paradox where uh, in the state of nature, there are no rules, right? There's theoretically absolute freedom, but in the state of nature, you're not actually free to do whatever you want. Uh, you, have to, you can do whatever you want as long as that involves defending yourself from everybody else all the time. Um, but otherwise, you're not really free to do whatever you want. But under the Leviathan, when nobody has to worry about defending themselves all the time, now they, in fact, are free to do all kinds of other things, like decide to be an artist or a pole vaulter or whatever. And so sometimes more rules equal more freedom. And it's that sort of, you know, more more real options, in other words. And it's those real options that are, you know, really in our interest. We want to have as many good options as possible, and a social contract can make some of that possible. And so we've seen some of the attempts of Hobbes and others try uh, to, to show that acting morally and abiding by the social contract is always in uh, your self-interest. In fact, that's even uh, stipulated in Rawls's social contract is that each of the people in the Veil of Ignorance are just stipulated. They're, they're self-interested. They care about themselves. Um, and so uh, if you think about the kinds of societies that, that you would choose from behind Rawls's Veil of Ignorance, uh, for example, if you if you t- take take consideration, imagine you're one of the people behind the veil of ignorance. You don't know anything about yourself. You don't know where you'd be in a society, and somebody shows you a model of what says what American society looked like in 1830, and you're supposed to decide whether you would accept this as a model for a society that you would live in or not. Well, so a really quick glance at it says, well, gosh, you know, there's a whole uh, a whole bunch of people that are actually slaves, right? They're owned by other people. Well, that would really suck. I don't think so. So I'm going to vote no on this one just to make sure that I don't uh, become a slave. And so they would isolate, insulate themselves from risk. Uh, even aside from the slavery, they might look and say, well, gosh, half the population, the, you know, the, even more than half, really, uh, the, the, a lot of the population, women namely, uh, can't, can't vote at all, right? Uh, you know, they can't voice their opinions or, you know, uh, there's all sorts of things. Or, you know, so you want to say, well, gosh, if I ended up being a woman in this society, that'd be terrible. So no, I mean, I'm going to vote no to insulate myself from the risk of this sort of a thing. 
And so uh, the idea is that uh, you end up with a, a very sort of compassionate, and equal society where everybody kind of has a, a basic minimum. And that, that's what, what Rawls thinks people would end up choosing. And the reason they would end up choosing is not because they care about anybody else, but because they care about themselves. Right. And they uh, they just don't want themselves to be screwed over uh, by some sort of, uh, you know, unfairness or, or, or uh, you know, very destructive inequality or something like that. And, and so, again, this is uh, where, you know, Hobbes and others have, have, have really gone a long way to illustrate that a social contract really is in each person's individual self-interest. Uh, but, of course, the objectors say that, uh, look, you might get away with immorality within a social contract society, right? But I think the social contract theorists would say that any good contract is going to have the risk of getting caught outweigh the possible benefits. And so, um, uh, you know, the, the very, not only legal cost, for example, if there's a, a government or a Leviathan in charge, but also the social consequences of the sort of other people, uh, you know, sort of recognizing you're, you're, you're not a good cooperator here. Okay. But there's some real question as to whether it's really always too risky or always a bad bet. Uh, in general, uh, so think of it this way. Um, uh, this is a... a what we call a kind of free rider problem. So imagine somebody who never pays their taxes, right? Who never sort of cooperates with this kind of a social contract. Well, look, if one person pays their taxes, uh, the system really continues, right? I mean, it doesn't really make uh, any big difference. You know, the roads can still get fixed, you know, the government can still operate and all that stuff. And there's just one person that sort of gets the benefit of not paying any of their taxes. And so then they can rightly feel like they're actually getting something for free, you know, that everybody else is a kind of chump. And uh, they're, you know, they're, they've outsmarted everybody, all right? And it's, there may be some risk there, but it may not always be all that risky. Uh, for example, maybe you uh, are taking a smaller risk, just hopping over the, the subway turnstiles instead of actually paying to ride the subway. Well, gosh, gosh, one free rider or two or three isn't going to make the whole system collapse, but you get to ride the system without paying to support it. Yeah, it's maybe unfair, but again, it might be a good bet. And in general, the more people who behave well, the less it breaks down the whole system if you behave badly. And so in a sense, if everybody tells the truth, then everybody will believe you when you lie to manipulate them. And that'll put you in something like a better position uh, to get your own way at the expense of everybody else. So in short, the more people uh, behave well, uh, the more incentive they give you to behave badly in order to benefit yourself instead of everybody else. And so the self-interest, it looks like, also works against the good functioning of the social contract and not just in favor of the good functioning of the social contract. This is a very interesting uh, uh, objection. So a second criticism that people often uh, bring up in uh, the in, in, in social contract theorists, is really about this whole business of consent, of, of, of agreeing, right, this contract uh, aspect of it. And so being part of a social contract requires that, of, that, that we all consent to live up to the contract. But of course, relatively few adults have explicitly consented to such a social contract, and actually I would say none, really. Uh, ask around. Hey, did you ever sign anything that says you're going to follow the various kinds of laws and moral codes that your society has? Uh, did you ever take some sort of broad oath to do all of the things that your society has demanded that you do uh, or anything like that? I mean, do we even have a list of what the contract really is or what it stipulates in particular? Of course we don't. In fact, the Enlightenment thinker David Hume wrote a really nice piece called uh, you know, on, on of the social contract or of the original contract is what he called it. Uh, and uh, in this, he sort of uh, uh, really criticizes the very idea that, that the consent of the government is necessary or required or even thought to be required by anybody in order to have a legitimate government. So he talks a lot about things like, well, look, you know, uh, most people, it doesn't even occur to them that their consent really matters because it frankly doesn't. Uh, so a kind of example that would resonate with uh, with this kind of a line of reasoning uh, would be like, you know, imagine a, a police officer pulls you over and said, OK, look, you were you know going 10 miles an hour over the speed limit. I'm going to write you a ticket. And you say, wait a second. Nobody asked me what the speed limit should be. I never agreed to this. Uh, and they're just going to look at you like you're dumb and say, you didn't have to agree to it. It's the law. You're driving. That's all right. And in fact, most people don't really believe that they, their consent was required before the law would apply to them. 
Uh, there are some very crazy people who think this is true, who think that they, you know, if they didn't agree to the government, they're their own government. They can do whatever they want. They can print their own currency. They can avoid paying taxes. And generally what happens is the actual government catches up with them and says, you know, says no, that's not true. You, you, you owe taxes. You have to obey the law, etc. And so uh, the social contract theorist has a kind of reply to this, the fact that there isn't any explicit consent going on here. And uh, the, so, so one of these replies is what's called uh, tacit consent, right? The idea is that we accept it implicitly by keeping silent, by not opposing the fact there's a government, and by reaping the benefits of society. The idea is that if you, are, if you go along and you cooperate and you get the benefit of everybody cooperating with you, uh, then you're sort of implying that you're, you're going right along with it, that you're making the same kind of promise that everyone else implies. Uh, this is a, a reasonable response, but it's a little weak because, of course, how do you know what everybody really, uh, you know, what, what the contract is if you didn't explicitly agree to it or swear to it? How does anybody else know? Uh, a more sophisticated reply is that you get this sort of ideally rational tacit consent. That is that every rational agent would consent to an ideal social code. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the notion is that, yeah, some people don't really think very clearly, and that's what that's really what the government is for, right? Otherwise, we could simply make an agreement and everybody could follow it. Uh, but the fact that not everybody sort of understands the agreement the same way, that's to be expected. Um, uh, but but any, any really ideally rational agent would set up society of the kind much like we have. Uh, and so that's a kind of, uh, again, sort of a, it's a very sophisticated reply to this uh, role of consent in the social contract objection. Next, we can talk about sort of disagreement under those who are uh, parties to the social contract. So suppose we grant that a social contract is legitimate if free and rational people would agree to live by it. Still, is it really true that all free and rational people would, disagree, would, would agree anyway about all aspects of any given social contract? The big point behind this objection is that it's really not clear that ideally rational people will agree about everything. That is, there may be room for rational disagreement, even radical rational disagreement. It is that a couple of different individuals might be quite rational about something uh, and yet still very much disagree about it. Uh, some people might think certain uh, parts of the moral code will be necessary. Others might not be so sure, and they may both have really excellent reasons for uh, believing what they believe. Uh, the, the trouble is now that it seems much harder for them to live in community with one another, that is, in the same contract, because there might be, again, very important things that people have very deep disagreements over that they can't necessarily uh, live uh, together. And finally, uh, the last criticism of the uh, of the the contract theory as as a perspective on on morality and justice is again this the the scope of the moral community. Much as we saw with Kant, we're going to see a very similar problem arise here. And so again, social contract theory would only apply to those who can actually enter the contract. That is, free rational agents. Uh, you know, there's a reason why you know people can't you can't sell a car to a 14 year old even if they have the money. You're like, well, they're not technically legal agents. They're not trusted to sort of, you know, make all their decisions or something like that. Um, so uh, the idea is that, the, that a contract, right, might only apply to somebody who really can enter the contract, that is, can understand it fully uh, uh, before, you know, how it, how it applies to them and all that stuff. They can, they can give their consent. And, and more than that, the contract would be guided by a kind of rational self-interest. And so if it isn't in our rational self-interest to agree to something, then we won't freely consent to it as part of the contract. But then the worry, right, the trouble here is that it's it's not in our rational self-interest to sacrifice our interest without some kind of compensation. The idea is, okay, if, if, if my cooperation with a social contract is valuable to everybody else, everyone else should give me something as well. And if so, then uh, things like caring for the environment, the animals, and the most vulnerable among us may not actually be in our rational self-interest, not, 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 not be the kind of thing we would independently choose if we could avoid it, even from behind uh, the veil of ignorance, if there's no compensation for sacrificing certain things. 
and so as such, the environment, animals, and the most vulnerable among us may fall outside the scope of the social contract. We may have no reason to include into it uh, uh, things that can contribute less to the to the overall contract, contribute less to the cooperation, um, and uh, you know because of uh, or, or or who simply can't sort of agree to the terms of uh, of the social contract. So just like Kant. Uh, uh, having a, a hard time describing what makes people worthy of moral consideration, even if they themselves are not moral agents, uh, the, the 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 moral the social contract theory has a very similar uh, kind of issue. They have a very hard time explaining uh, again what makes people a moral agent, right, uh, or what makes people a moral subject, even if they are not a moral agent, even if they can't be a party to some kind of an agreement, right? Why wouldn't we protect them anyway?